33 and counting. Metropolis. Holly Robinson trudged through the Greyhound bus station, doing her best to keep a low profile. To her relief, none of the other travelers making their way across the crowded terminal appeared to be paying any attention to the inconspicuous young woman wearing an open army surplus jacket over jeans and a Hello Kitty t-shirt. A hunting cap was clamped tightly onto her head, the visor and ear flaps helping to conceal her gamine features. Mirrored sunglasses hid her tired blue eyes. Her short red hair was now dyed a mousy shade of brown. A battered canvas travel bag containing all that remained of her worldly possessions was slung over her shoulder. <sighs> Overdressed for the temperature, she sweated beneath her thick jacket. Her butt ached from the two-hour bus ride from Gotham City. A pair of cheap wool gloves kept her fingerprints to herself. A newsstand displayed a variety of daily papers. Polly paused to glance over the headlines. Even God's Die proclaimed the front page of the Daily Planet above a black and white photo of Superman bearing the lifeless body of some costumed alien named Light Ray. But it was today's edition of the Gotham Gazette that made her heart miss a beat. Cop killer still at large, her hometown newspaper lamented, above an unflattering mugshot of one Holly Robinson. Oh, crap. She resisted the urge to flip the topmost paper over and instead crept furtively away from the newsstand, keeping her head low. Her finger pressed the shades farther up her nose, just to make sure they stayed in place. Spotting a bored-looking cop standing guard over the station, she took the long way around to avoid him. Her heart was pounding a mile a minute. At any moment, she expected someone to look up from their paper and shout, There she is, the cop killer! In fact, the truth was far more complicated. Not so long ago, Holly had prowled the east end of Gotham as Catwoman, filling in for Selina Kyle, the original Catwoman, while Selina was on her own version of maternity leave. Holly was not nearly the femme fatale that Selina was, but she thought she filled Catwoman's black leather boots reasonably well, until a run-in with two sadistic Russian supervillains exposed her secret identity and cost an unlucky cop his head. Holly had not been responsible for the detective's grisly decapitation, but tried telling an outraged GCPD that, with the entire police force out for her blood, she had been lucky to get out of Gotham at all. Exiting the bus station, she wandered out onto the sidewalk. A cold autumn breeze drove her to pull her jacket closed. Ugh. She rested her bag on the pavement while she tried to figure out which way to go. This was her first time in Metropolis, and the strange city stretched out all around her, vast and intimidating. Born and raised in Gotham, Holly felt lost and alone. She extracted a cell phone from her pocket. The on-screen menu listed her most frequent contacts, Selena, Bruce, Dick, Karen. Her throat tightened, and a solitary tear ran down her cheek. Karen's smiling face, spiky pink hair, and hip designer glasses surfaced from her memory. Holly's index finger hovered over the name of her girlfriend. She'd give anything to hear Karen's voice right now. No! Holly's nocturnal clashes with Gotham's criminal underworld had already put Karen in the intensive care ward once. Never again, Holly vowed. She loved Karen too much to bring down any more heat on her. Holly may have left a certain glossy black cat suit behind in Gotham, but she knew that she was still bad luck for anyone who got too close to her. The best thing she could do for Karen, and all her other friends and loved ones, was disappear entirely. She tossed the phone into a nearby waste bin. Hefting her heavy bag back onto her shoulder, she took off down the street toward nowhere in particular. The bus station turned out to be located in a somewhat seedy part of town, around the corner from a topless bar and a plasma collection center. Flop houses, soup kitchens, and liquor stores catered to a less than affluent clientele. Broken glass, crushed beer cans, and cigarette butts littered the sidewalk. She could do this, she reminded herself. She'd lived like this before. She'd been a teenage runaway at 13, fleeing an abusive home environment, and had never looked back. Excuse me, you look like you need a place to stay? Holly rolled her eyes. She should have seen this coming. Pimps were always haunting bus stations looking for fresh meat, as Holly knew from personal experience. She'd worked the streets herself as Holly go nightly before Selena helped her escape that life. Sorry, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> you mistake my intentions. I'm no predator. 
just a concerned sister. Holly turned around and was surprised to behold a statuesque woman clad in a flowing silk robe. Auburn hair was bound up at the back of her head in a matronly fashion. Cool gray eyes peered from the woman's elegant features. Her narrow lips and strong chin reminded Holly of a priceless Greek idol that Selena had once stolen from the Gotham Museum. A golden circlet crowned the woman's high forehead, while more gold glittered upon her throat, wrists, and ears. In her sandaled feet, she stood at least a head taller than Holly. I have to admit, you don't look like the usual chicken hawk. Call me Athena. I run the women's shelter across the street. She pointed at a nondescript red brick building on the other side of the avenue. A surprisingly classy-looking collection of tapestries and ceramics was displayed in the first floor window. Medusa's head, complete with serpentine tresses, was embossed upon a hanging bronze shield occupying a place of honor within the exhibit. A freshly painted sign mounted over the front entrance identified the building as the Athenian Women's Shelter. Holly recalled that Athena was the Greek goddess of wisdom. She was supposed to be tight with Wonder Woman these days. The graceful stranger certainly looked the part, but surely she didn't expect Holly to believe that she was actually that Athena. I have a feeling that you'll find a place for yourself there. She raised her arm, and to Holly's amazement, a snow-white owl descended from the sky to alight upon Athena's wrist. If not, you don't have to stay. Really? You have my word. The sun was sinking toward the horizon, and it was already starting to get darker and colder outside. Holly's stomach rumbled irritably. Lunch had been a bag of potato chips from a vending machine back in Gotham. Well, what could it hurt? Maybe she could get a warm meal out of this, then bail later if things got weird. All right. She followed Athena across the street. The sidewalk in front of the shelter was noticeably cleaner than the rest of the block. Stone griffins guarded the front steps. Athena opened the door and stepped aside to let the younger woman enter. Holly kept her guard up, but wasn't too worried. Even if this was some sort of trap, she was confident that she could take care of herself. Whoa. The doorway opened onto a spacious lobby, holding dozens of lithe young women in short linen tunics. Of every race and ethnicity, they milled about the palatial chamber. More women lounged on scattered chairs and sofas, snacking on olives and wine. Holly tried not to ogle too obviously, but she couldn't help noticing that they were all attractive and in excellent shape. The lobby's decor matched the overpowering beauty of its inhabitants. Belying its humdrum outer facade, the building's interior was a masterpiece of classical Greek architecture. Pristine white columns supported the domed ceiling, which boasted shining gold filigree. Olive trees sprouted from decorative ceramic urns. Holly lifted her shades to make sure she was seen correctly. Overall, this place looked more like a five-star hotel or spa than any homeless shelter she had ever set foot in before. Who's funding this joint? Bruce Wayne? Curious eyes turned toward Holly. Welcome home, Holly. The streetwise fugitive was so dumbfounded that it never even occurred to her to wonder how the other woman knew her name. Metropolis. Suicide Slum was only slightly less threatening in broad daylight. Pawn shops, liquor stores, taverns, adult video stores, tattoo parlors, and check cashing venues made up the bulk of the local businesses. <laughs> Gangs of street toughs lounged on the stoops and sidewalks. Most pedestrians hurried past them, eyes carefully lowered in hopes of avoiding a confrontation. But not Jimmy. Jimmy Olsen was dressed in his Sunday best as he strolled down Hobbs Lane. Two of his priciest cameras dangled from his neck. His press pass was pinned to the lapel of a designer jacket. Jimmy figured that he made a pretty tempting target, which was the whole idea. A trickle of sweat running down his temple betrayed his anxiety. Walking around suicide slum like this was just asking for trouble. But how else was he going to figure out what was up with his on-again, off-again superpowers? As nearly as he could tell, they only manifested under stress. Like when he or someone else was in danger. This isn't suicide. It's a scientific experiment. Sort of. Sup, fellas? A trio of tough-looking customers were camped out on the stoop of a graffiti-covered crack house. Matching red bandanas and pyramid amulets tagged them as members in full standing of the Sphinxes, one of the city's most violent street gangs. 
How about those metros? Metros suck, yo. We're Yankee fans. In fact, we're on our way to a game right now. Maybe we take your camera so we can take some pictures and your money so we can buy the tickets. And your shoes. Just because. They surrounded Jimmy on the sidewalk, cutting off any chance of escape. Nearby pedestrians hurried away in the opposite direction. Part of Jimmy wished he could join them, but he was committed now. Oh yeah? You and what army? Raising his fists, he charged forward and kicked the nearest gang member in the kneecap. Oh, are you little... Jimmy's poised leg muscles waited eagerly for another burst of superhuman speed. He threw his head back, expecting his neck to elongate like before as tattooed knuckles reared back. Boy, were these punks in for a surprise when his astounding new abilities kicked in. Any minute now. The blow sent Jimmy reeling backward into an overflowing trash can. Tasting blood in his mouth, he probed his front teeth with his tongue. Nothing was missing, thank goodness, but a couple of incisors felt loose. Maybe he should have told Superman he was coming here, just in case. Oh, okay, guys. Sorry for the misunderstanding. Have a good time at the game. Popcorn's on me. Uh, go Yankees? Go this fool! The gang leader grabbed Jimmy's throat with murder in his eyes. Nobody messes with me and keeps sucking oxygen. A tingling sensation rushed over his body before he knew it. Needle-sharp spines poked up from his skin like the quills of a porcupine. The spines shot from his face and palms. Looking like he had just run face first into a cactus, the punk scrambled backward. Whoa! Let's bounce! Holy crap! Assisting their limping comrade, the gang members beat a hasty retreat. Dude's a freak! Jimmy barely noticed their departure. My God! He was too busy staring in shock at the quills projecting from his hands. For a second, he feared that he had permanently turned into some sort of human porcupine. Then the pointy spines retracted back into his flesh. <sighs> Within seconds, they had vanished entirely. Only a scattering of fallen quills upon the pavement proved that he hadn't imagined the whole thing. I don't understand. Why'd they come out when that guy tried to choke me, but not when he slugged me? And why shooting spines anyway? His experiment had been a success of sorts, but it left him even more confused than before. Gathering his things, Jimmy clambered to his feet and made tracks toward the nearest subway station. His jaw ached, a dizzying mix of fear and excitement at his brain a whirl. What's happening to me? Thirty-two and counting. Gotham City. Longer bound by gravity, Mary Marvel soared through the heart of a raging thunderstorm. She thrilled in the fury of the tempest and her newfound powers. Turbulent winds caressed her, and driving sheets of rain baptized her rebirth. 40,000 thunderstorms happened every day, and right now, she could feel 10,000 storms scattered between Gotham and Beijing. She was one with the lightning. This is amazing! This is even better than before! She twirled high above the city, exhilarated by the sheer bliss of being able to fly once more. All her prayers had been answered, and then some. How on earth could Tep Adam walk away from a feeling like this? She wasn't just powered by magic anymore, she was magic. Her entire body was attuned to the mystical energies flowing unseen through the city below. Hmm. She felt a subtle distortion in the ley lines and realized that something was seriously amiss. Perhaps that was why Madame Xanadu had tried to warn Mary away from Gotham before. As it turned out, however, the seer need not have been concerned. With the combined powers of Black Adam and Isis at her disposal, Mary felt more than ready to deal with whatever occult menace awaited her. Time to show the world that Mary Marvel is back and better than ever. She swooped down from the clouds toward an apartment building in Midtown, near a 19th century clock tower. Her heightened senses drew her straight to the source of the disturbance. 
Five pregnant women, clad in matching white robes, knelt atop the roof of the building. They faced each other from the five points of a pentagram. The pouring rain plastered their ceremonial robes to their swollen bodies. Swirling fumes rose from a lit cauldron at the center of the pentagram. Freshly spilled blood traced the outlines of the five-pointed star. Okay, this can't be a good idea. Stop! You don't know what you're doing! But they knew enough to raise a little hell, apparently. Before Mary could do anything... Fire and brimstone erupted from the cauldron, instantly incinerating all five congregants. Blindsided, Mary threw up an arm to protect her face from the bright orange flames. By the time she lowered her arm an instant later, the hellfire had died away. And an honest-to-goodness demon stood atop the roof, surrounded by the smoking remains of the careless coven. Curved horns crested the demon's skull. Fiery red eyes glowed like hellfire, and cloven hooves rested on the rooftop. What was really disturbing was what the demon was wearing. The creature appeared to be clad in a suit made up entirely of dead babies. Overlapping layers of emaciated infants squirmed all over the demon's leathery hide. Their shriveled, wrinkly faces were more hideous than cute. Cyanotic blue skin was stretched tightly over their bony bodies. The smell was rancid and overwhelming. Ugh, now that's just gross. Mary descended directly into the demon's field of vision, hovering only a few yards above the rooftop. So, what's your deal? Faringula halokanosako, dimini morti for mangala chi. Oh yeah, how many times have I heard that before? I am Faringula, the harvester of stillborn souls. Forgive me, I have not spoken English in over 600 years. And your peculiar idioms are unfamiliar to me. Long have I been trapped outside this sphere of existence. No doubt for the betterment of humanity. Mary glanced at the steaming piles of ashes that were all that remained of the unfortunate coven. Too bad those dimwits let you back in. Yes, for you. He flung out his arm, and a flood of writhing fetuses shot across the distance between them. Dozens of grabby little hands seized her with unexpected strength. Ah! Tugging painfully on her hair, clothes, and flesh, they dragged her down toward Pharyngula, until the demon's leering face was only inches away from her own. She felt his hot, sulfurous breath upon her face. The dead babies swarmed over her body, enveloping her in their greedy clutches. Her skin crawled beneath her clammy touch, and a forked tongue ripped her cheek. Oh, hey! What do you think you're doing, you pediatric pest? Uh, how do you say it in English? Ah! <laughs> I'm going to devour your flesh and suck the digested waste from your intestines. Ugh, oh, yuck! You spent too much time on the internet, mister. Mary wasn't just a frail, helpless girl anymore. If this revolting monstrosity thought she couldn't defend herself against a pack of stinking rugrats, he had a lot to learn. Calling upon the strength of Amun, she tore herself free from the avalanche of stillborn infants. You're paying for that! Big time! A roundhouse punch connected with the demon's jaw. He went flying off the roof and plunged seven stories to the street below, where he smashed through the roof of a parked Mercedes. Mary hoped that Pharyngula had survived the fall. She wasn't done with him yet. The demon rose from the crushed metal and pavement. Mortal harlot! I will consume your filthy human womb! Listen to the mouth on you! Fists first, she dived at her foe. His crimson orbs bulged in alarm. He ducked beneath her assault, throwing himself face down onto the mangled luxury car. Mary whooshed above his head, her gloved knuckles grazing the back of his skull. Ooh, smooth move, but don't think you're getting away from me that easily. 
she grabbed onto the chassis of an empty SUV and carried it up into the sky with her. Whirling in midair, she raised the huge gas-guzzling vehicle above her head and took aim at the demon below. You, that child! Wait! I merely desire to inhabit this world again. I will eat only what I need to survive! No deal! Mary watched with satisfaction as an enormous fireball erupted. Oh yeah! That felt great! Damn you! The demon's nauseating coat of babies was charred and smoking. Flames licked at the blackened flesh. He tottered unsteadily upon his cloven hooves, a broken arm hanging limply at his side. You have no right to deny me my rightful repast! Predator and prey alike! All creatures eat! And I am starving! Sorry, Devil Daycare. You may have a lot of mouths to feed, but you're not stuffing them with human flesh! Launching herself at Pharyngula, she seized the monster's throat with one hand. The outmatched demon was in no shape to fight back. Her fingers dug into his scaly neck. Time to stop playing around! She drew back her fist. Mystical energy sparked and crackled around her clenched knuckles. Say goodbye to your head, baby snatcher. But before she could deliver the fatal blow, a blazing lightning bolt stabbed down from the heavens. A blinding flash of light briefly turned the night into day, and when the dazzling glare faded, no trace remained of either the girl or the demon. Only a smoking pile of rubble marked the site of their confrontation. Metropolis. Help! Somebody! <laughs> a scruffy-looking lowlife darted out of an alley, clutching a designer handbag in one hand and an open switchblade in the other. Not so fast! Jimmy Olsen stepped out from beneath the shelter of a recessed doorway and directly into the path of the knife-wielding thief. Arms akimbo, he struck a heroic pose, the better to show off his homemade superhero costume. A blue cowl concealed the upper half of Jimmy's face. A blue letter A was emblazoned on the bright red tunic he wore over a navy blue sweater and trousers. A wide yellow sash circled his waist. Red gloves and boots, snazzily trimmed with yellow, completed the outfit. Ought to watch where you're going, Dirtball, because you never know when Mr. Action will be on the scene. Mr. Who? Out of my way, jerk face. With his knife, he slashed at Jimmy, or Mr. Action. Jimmy was hoping he'd try something like that. Sure enough, his torso stretched away from the striking blade. An elastic arm wrapped around the thief's knife hand, trapping it. Thorny spines protruded from Jimmy's knuckles, only seconds before he slugged the mother in the chin. Huh. Maybe I should have drawn it out a bit longer. Ever since he decided to emulate Superman and use his mysterious new powers to combat evil, Jimmy had been looking forward to Mr. Action's big debut. He'd spent hours designing his costume while trying to come up with a perfect superheroic alias. Uh, definitely gotta work on the banter, too. An attractive blonde, about Jimmy's age, emerged from the alley. A sexy off-the-shoulder gold lame mini dress and glittery disco belt suggested that she had been taking a shortcut home from a nightclub when the mugger had ambushed her. Here's your handbag, miss. Are you all right? Oh, I think so. Oh my god, that was amazing! Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm, uh, glad to have, uh... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what came over me. You're just so adorable. Clutching her rescued handbag, she walked down the well-lit avenue this time and gave Jimmy a parting smile over her shoulder. Thank you. She was a full block away before Jimmy realized that he'd never gotten her name. This minor lapse did little to curb his euphoria, however. Wow, this superhero business is going even better than I dreamed. Hey! 
Spinning around, he spotted the mugger escaping back into the alley. Rats, he must have come to while I was distracted. Jimmy threw out his arms. <sighs> but now that he was no longer in danger, his limbs stubbornly refused to stretch after the thief. Shoot. <laughs> Jimmy pursued the crook, only to discover that his super speed had evaporated as well. Within moments, the fleet-footed criminal had disappeared into a shadowy maze of back alleys. Jimmy reluctantly abandoned the chase. Well, I did get the girl her purse back. Not bad for a first try. I'll do better next time. <sighs> Holly could get used to this. She soaked luxuriously in a steaming hot tub, enjoying the Athenian women's shelter's well-equipped spa. She had the tub to herself, but she was not the only one taking advantage of the sumptuous facilities. Young women, clad only in towels or terry cloth robes, indulged in free massages and herbal treatments, coming and going at will. Holly's own robe was draped over a nearby bench. Windows of polarized glass let in the sunlight while keeping out prying eyes. It all seemed too good to be true, but Holly had yet to find the catch. She'd been at the shelter for days now, and no one had tried to sell her into white slavery or convert her to some creepy cult. Nor had she spotted any hidden spy cams streaming video to pervs on the internet. Granted, statues and shrines to the goddess Athena could be found on every floor of the shelter, but there wasn't any obvious brainwashing going on. Holly found herself in no hurry to leave. It sure beat camping out in a soggy cardboard box. Oh, there you are! Holly looked up to see a svelte blonde, about her own age and size, strolling toward the tub. She wore the same belted white tunic, which Holly had learned was called a chitin, that served as standard attire around the shelter. Braided yellow pigtails gave her a slightly comic appearance, as did the goofy smile plastered across her face. Not exactly Holly's type, but cute enough in her own way. A platter bearing a teapot and porcelain cup was expertly balanced atop the blonde's head. I brought you some Kyokuro Japanese tea! She knelt down and placed the platter at the edge of the tub. I hope you're enjoying yourself, Holly. Oh, totally. Great! Holly was mildly embarrassed that she didn't know the other woman's name. She looked oddly familiar, but there were so many new faces here. By Holly's estimate, at least three dozen women currently resided in the shelter all young, physically fit, and apparently unattached. The conspicuous absence of any single mothers or older women had struck Holly as curious, but it had been explained to her that by Athena's decree, women with children and senior citizens were beyond the purview of this particular institution. Holly wasn't sure she entirely approved of that. Still, as a newcomer and a guest, she didn't feel comfortable telling Athena how to run her own shelter. At least, not yet. This place is a godsend. It saved my life, and that of just about every other woman here. Making herself comfortable, she stretched out beside the tub. Uh, uh, I tell you, honey, before I got here, I was a real mess. And trust me, that's the understatement of the year. Uh, thanks. This is delicious. Athena turned my life around. She taught me to love and respect myself for me. You know, I was the kind of girl that always needed a man, even if he was the worst possible example of the species. My last boyfriend was a real maniac. Uh, I'm not really here because of Oh, that. honey, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. This is a pressure-free zone. <gasps> oh, gosh, where's my manners? I didn't introduce myself. I'm Harleen Quinzel. Harleen Quinzel, also known as Harley Quinn, the Joker's girlfriend. Holly had never run into the notorious Harley Quinn before, but Selena had, and she'd had nothing good to say about the Joker's devoted mall, who was supposed to be just as bonkers as the clown prince of crime himself. Harley wasn't joking when she said that her ex was a maniac. She just left out the homicidal part. Holly scrutinized the blonde's features, mentally adding a domino mask, jester's cap, and white clown makeup. Don't look at me like that. I told you I've changed. I'm a new woman. Besides, I'm not the one who spent her entire adult life sucking up the cat woman. Huh? She knew who Holly was?
31 and counting. One minute, Mary had been in Gotham City, about to knock that demon's block off. The next, she found herself somewhere else. Rough stone walls enclosed a murky tunnel that appeared to have been carved out of the solid rock surrounding her. The granite floor beneath her boots had been worn smooth by the passage of centuries. Torches sputtered in polished brass sconces. Disoriented, it took Mary a second to realize where she was. It's the Rock of Eternity! The mystical sanctuary, which existed outside time and space, had once been the home of the wizard Shazam. Before the specter slew the venerable mage, Mary had often visited these tunnels before, but without her powers, she'd been unable to reach the rock after waking up from her coma. It wasn't exactly the sort of place you could catch a bus or taxi to. Yet here she was, without even trying. Mary looked around eagerly, hoping to find Freddy or her brother but she appeared to have the dimly lit passageway all to herself. Even Ferengula was nowhere to be seen. Hello? Is anyone here? Just you and me, Mary. Billy! Cap! Her heart leapt. She rushed down the corridor past a row of grotesque stone idols representing the seven deadly enemies of man. Pride, avarice, lust, wrath, gluttony, envy, and sloth. These were not just statues, but the actual sins trapped in stone by the wizard's magic. Knowing exactly where she was now, Mary dashed through a framed archway into the cavernous throne room beyond. Her brother was waiting for her. At least, she thought it was her brother. Billy? Is that really you? She barely recognized him at first. Instead of his cheerful red and yellow uniform, Captain Marvel now wore a spotless white version of his traditional costume. Only the golden thunderbolt and trimmings remained the same. His revised garb was as chastely white as her own new look was black as pitch. His short black hair had also turned snow white and was now several inches longer. There was something different about his manner, too. Even though her twin brother turned into an adult whenever he said the magic word, he had always kept his youthful exuberance and sunny disposition. But now, the weight of the world seemed to rest heavily upon his broad shoulders. His wide face was etched with worry lines that Mary was certain she had never seen before. In a way, his austere, authoritative demeanor reminded her of the ageless wizard who had once presided over the throne room. It's me, Mary. After a fashion. Oh, Billy. What's happened to you? It's complicated, Mary. After Shazam died, the world of magic was thrown into flux. All the power he controlled, all the dark forces he held at bay ran amok. The old rules were rewritten. Malevolent entities, long barred from the mortal plane, began to find their way back into the world. Like Pharyngela? Yeah, what happened to him anyway? You needn't worry about him any longer. He's been banished back to the netherworld. Does all this have something to do with why I lost my powers? I'm afraid so. In order to heal itself, the power of Shazam drew upon the marvels, taking back the gifts it had bestowed on us before. You and Freddy both lost your powers, while, as for me, well, the power needed a new vessel here at the Rock of Eternity. Someone had to fill the void left by the wizard's absence. You. Me. He smiled sadly, and for a moment, Mary thought she spied a trace of the boyish hero she remembered. Unlike before, when I would wield the power of the gods, now I am the keeper of that power just like Shazam used to be. But you're still Billy in there, right? You seem... different. Like you've changed somehow. What's this power done to you? I grew up. Something about that simple declaration struck Mary as immeasurably sad. And Freddy? Well, the power still needs a champion on Earth. Freddy is on a quest to prove himself worthy of that mantle. If he passes his trials... If he survives, he will become the world's mightiest mortal. He looked somberly into Mary's eyes. It may be some time before you see him again, if ever. And what about me? Where do I fit into all these changes? That's why I brought you here. <sighs> he sat down upon the marble throne. I'm afraid we have a problem. A big one. I don't understand. What do you mean? 
I watched your battle against Feringula. Frankly, it left me concerned. Why? I was just doing what I used to do. I was fighting evil. It's the way you went about it. I've never seen you so brutal, so savage. Even after Feringula had no more fight left in him, you didn't let up. You looked like you were on the verge of killing him. Mary felt a little indignant. He was a flesh-eating demon, wasn't he? Look at you, Mary. Even your uniform is darker than before. What's happened to you? The power I have now... It came from Black Adam. Mary wondered briefly how Adam had managed to retain his powers after she and Freddy had lost theirs. Perhaps it was because he derived his strength from an entirely different pantheon of gods. He surrendered it to me willingly. <laughs> what? Apparently Billy's magic mirrors had missed that particular development. Are you out of your mind? You have no idea what that tainted power could do to you. I... What was I supposed to do? I woke up from a coma. I had no powers. And I was totally alone. I couldn't find Freddy. I couldn't find you. What else was I to do? <sighs> Start a new life? He stepped forward and laid a comforting hand upon her shoulder. Mary, did you ever think that maybe it was destiny that you lost your powers? That you weren't meant to have them forever? You don't know that. Did you ever think that perhaps my getting Black Adam's power was precisely what was supposed to happen? She shrugged his hand away from her shoulder. You don't know what it was like for me before, after you abandoned me in that miserable hospital. I have power again, Billy. And I'm going to use it for good, just like before. First Madame Xanadu, now her own brother. They seemed determined to keep her weak and helpless, like she was still just a child who couldn't be trusted to fight evil on her own. And if you can't approve of that, then I'll... I'll have to pursue my destiny alone! Mary, wait! Shattered stalactites rained down onto the throne room as Mary smashed through solid rock like a human missile. She was her own woman now, not just Captain Marvel's teenage sister. With the awesome powers at her disposal, she could easily find her own way back to the mortal plane. Her fists drilled a brand new tunnel through the Rock of Eternity until she burst out into the timeless ether outside, leaving behind a gaping cavity in the floating stone spire. Spectral shapes and apparitions drifted like cloud formations through an empty gray void. Mary! Mary was alone again, but that didn't seem quite so bad anymore. Look out, world. Here I come. San Francisco. Titan's Tower occupied an island in the harbor, not far from the Golden Gate Bridge. Jimmy could see the famous bridge from the top floor of the gleaming T-shaped high-rise that served as the headquarters for the youthful champions known as the Teen Titans. One-way bulletproof windows offered a spectacular view of the misty bay below. Is this your idea of a joke, Olsen? Um, no. Robin eyed Mr. Action dubiously. The slim, athletic teenager already had an impressive reputation as a crime fighter. Jimmy had caught a red-eye flight from Metropolis just to make this appointment with Robin, who currently served as the leader of the Titans. To Jimmy's disappointment, none of the other Titans seemed to be around. Seriously, is Lois Lane hiding here with a video camera somewhere? Listen to me, I'm not here for the planet. I want to join the Teen Titans. He'd given the matter plenty of thought. As promising as his solo career as a superhero looked to be, he could only imagine the awesomeness he'd bring to a group dynamic. Jimmy, no offense, I, but... I know, I don't blame you. I wouldn't believe me either. But give me a chance and I'll show you what I can do. I'm not just Jimmy Olsen, cub reporter anymore. I'm Mr. Action. Mr. Action? So, guess all the good names really are taken. Said the guy named after a bird. Jimmy had the good sense not to say... Ahem. Attack me. Don't be afraid. I want you to attack me so I can show you my powers. Okay. Let's talk about what's going on here, Jimmy. I need you to take me seriously. Look, I know you're tight with Superman. Sometimes, when we have a close relationship with, say, a father figure, who also happens to be famous... This isn't about Superman! I have powers! I don't know why or how, but I have them, and I want to use them to help people. Uh, all right. 
I'll attack you. Great! Now we're talking! Okay, let's do it! Oh, jeez. I'm sorry, I thought you'd duck. Uh, I... I don't understand. I should have stretched or something. I didn't hit you that hard. Are you okay? Do you need to visit the infirmary? Uh, I'm okay, thanks. Wait. This happened before in Metropolis. These guys in Suicide Slum attacked me, but it wasn't until my life was in danger... Wait a minute. You held back! Of course I did. You think I want Superman pissed off at me when I send his pal back to Metropolis in a neck brace? <sighs> There's no chance I can get you to attack me for real, is there? I'm sorry, Jimmy. If it makes you feel any better, we're really not looking for any more Titans right now. We're cramped enough as it is. Jimmy wondered if that was true, or if Robin was just being polite. Look, let's not have an American Idol moment. You're a photographer, and a damn good one. Don't discount the impact you make on people's lives. Stick with what you're good at. Right. Jimmy appreciated Robin's attempts to soften the blow, but he wasn't ready to throw in the towel just yet. Even if he wasn't cut out to be a superhero, he knew he'd been given these powers for a reason. One way or another, he was going to find out what they were for. Or die trying. Thirty and counting. Gotham City. An ear-splitting explosion greeted Mary Marvel's return to the mortal plane. Descending from the night sky, she saw flames and smoke erupting from the uptown branch of the Gotham National Bank. The blistering heat from the fire could be felt even high above the city. Thick black smoke filled her nostrils. A glance at a clock tower informed her that it was nearly three in the morning. Thank goodness. At this hour, it was unlikely that anyone had been inside the bank when it blew up. Probably no need to search for casualties. Assuming that the approaching authorities could cope with the blaze on their own, Mary scanned the scene from the air, looking for some clue as to the origin of the explosion. Foul play seemed like a safe bet, Banks seldom exploded on their own, especially in Gotham City. Mary wasn't the only one taking in the show. Her eyes lit up as she spied a lanky figure watching the fireworks from the rooftop of a five-story building across the street from the burning bank. Embossed purple question marks sewn into the fabric of a dapper green suit, tie, and bowler hat immediately identified the onlooker as Batman's longtime nemesis, Edward Nigma, a.k.a. the Riddler. He lowered a pair of high-powered binoculars. Intent upon the fire, he appeared unaware of Mary spying on him from above. Well, 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 what have we here? Explosions, alarms, and one big-name Gotham bad guy just begging for an ass-kicking. I would agree with your assessment, young lady, although it appears I should make you aware of certain facts before you... Hey! His bowler hat went flying as she grabbed onto his collar and plucked him off the rooftop. <laughs> Before you jump to conclusions and turn me into street pizza, my dear, although I sincerely hope that such a virtuous Girl Scout as yourself would never do such a thing, I must inform you that, as a duly licensed private investigator, I don't commit crimes any longer. I solve them. <laughs> oh, what are you saying? That you've reformed? Ask Batman if you don't believe me. I don't. I saw you. You were at the crime scene before the police. Riddle your way out of that one. It's no mystery. Like you, I heard the explosion and came to investigate. Twisting in her grasp, he pointed down at the sidewalk far below. Look! See that muddy trail leading away from the bank? It will most assuredly lead us to whoever's really behind this outrage. Mary descended to the rooftop to get a closer look. To her annoyance, she saw that a trail of thick brown glop did indeed stretch from the rear of the bank to the mouth of a secluded alley a few blocks away. Given that there were no parks or gardens nearby, the large quantity of mud looked distinctly out of place. Maybe the Riddler was actually onto something. As a matter of fact, I was just about to follow it before your timely arrival. He retrieved his hat from where it had fallen before. In his emerald outfit, he looked like a tall, skinny leprechaun. 
What do you say, Mary Marvel? Care to play girl detective? Okay. You bought yourself five more unbruised minutes, but don't expect me to trust you, Riddler. She took hold of his shoulder and dived toward the alley in question. <clears throat> How exhilarating. <laughs> you don't believe people can change, do you, little Miss Mary? <laughs> Once a criminal, always a criminal. By the glow of the streetlights, Nigma scoped her recent makeover, her sleek black dress and boots. Then answer me this. What used to be bright and sunny, but is now black all over? <sighs> Point taken. But consider yourself warned. I might not be such a Girl Scout anymore. I'll forgo asking you for cookies then. But about your new look, Mary. I have to say I'm not really a big fan. A little too dark night for my tastes. Hey, there's something I don't need. Fashion tips from a goofball in a green derby. No need to get defensive. Bowing at the waist, Nigma stepped aside to let Mary lead the way into the murky alley. <clears throat> Ladies first. Oh, sure. Hide behind the bulletproof girl. But of course. With the police and firefighters still preoccupied with containing the fire, the two of them had the telltale smears of mud all to themselves. As Mary marched deeper into the alley, leaving the streetlights behind, she wondered why someone would blow up a bank on purpose. To make a political statement? Or just to destroy all evidence of a bank heist? And what was the deal with all this mud, anyway? There weren't any mucky footsteps on the ground. Only scattered clumps of slick brown goo. Hmm. Intriguing. Most intriguing. Mary had no idea what he was finding so fascinating. Looking around, she didn't see any obvious clues. Just a dirty alley full of rusty trash cans, empty liquor bottles, and a soggy cardboard box that was probably some wino's home address. A glimpse of the bat signal, shining brightly through the smoke-filled sky, prompted her to wonder why Batman was nowhere to be seen, probably dealing with some bigger emergency. The trail led to a literal dead end. A high concrete wall topped by concertina wire blocked their path. A sizable heap of mud, large enough to fill a wheelbarrow or two, was deposited at the base of the wall. Mary could easily fly over or smash through the barrier, of course, but that wasn't the point. Hmm. End of the line, it would seem. The Riddler slipped past Mary to examine the mound of mud. Extracting a customized green and purple pencil from his pocket, he poked at the gunk experimentally. Although you know, I'm beginning to suspect that this isn't actually mud at all. Okay, Sherlock, what is it? Before he could answer, <gasps> the pencil was sucked from his grasp. He jumped back from the quivering sludge, as before their eyes, it suddenly came to life. The amorphous muck rose up from the pavement to take on a vaguely humanoid form. Beady red eyes ogled Mary from a crude approximation of a face. A pair of pulsating slits provided a mere suggestion of a nose. The mouth was just an open gash beneath the nostrils. It's clay, genius. Mary kicked herself for not figuring it out earlier. The being before her was one of Batman's most freakish foes, a malleable mass of malevolence that had once been an unscrupulous treasure hunter named Matt Hagen. Clayface. You bet, honey. <laughs> Drawing the excess sludge back into his person, he expanded until he towered over both Mary and the Riddler, who scurried behind Mary, using her as a shield. Too bad Nigma and you couldn't leave well enough alone. Clayface surged at them like a tidal wave, engulfing them in a flood of viscous muck, which clung to Mary like a sticky mixture of quicksand and wet cement. The Riddler flailed wildly, struggling to keep his head above the suffocating clay. Mary! Where are you? Here! The squishy clay was everywhere, in Mary's hair, on her face, enveloping her entire body. I'm here, and I'm not happy. A mouth appeared next to her ear. You should have stayed out of Gotham, babe. <laughs> you ain't dirty enough for this town. <laughs> oh, is that so? We'll see about that! She broke loose of Clayface's slimy embrace, sending broken chunks of clay in all directions. The monster hurled a glutinous fist at her. 
but she deftly evaded the punch so that it splattered uselessly against the wall behind her. Come on, Nigma! Taking to the air, she yanked the Riddler free as well and tossed him none too gently out of harm's way. The empty cardboard shelter cushioned his landing, which Mary figured was probably more than he deserved. Don't worry, Mary! I've got your back! Yeah, right. Think you can sucker punch Mary Marvel and get away with it, Clayface? Guess again! Calling upon the speed of Heru, as well as Isis's divine mastery of the winds, she flew circles around Clayface at faster and faster speeds until she generated a whirling cyclone that sucked up every last clump of the monster's gelatinous substance, along with any nearby trap. The roaring whirlwind lifted Clayface off the ground and sent him rocketing into orbit. In the tornado's wake, a canvas bag crashed to the ground. Coins, greenbacks, and expensive jewelry spilled onto the floor of the alley, immediately attracting the Riddler's attention. <laughs> Case closed, Mary! I've uncovered the loot! And I shot Clayface into outer space! Mary wiped a few leftover traces of Clayface from her face and costume. Ugh, gross. Cut off from the monster's animating intelligence, the remaining clumps of clay flaked off her easily. Outer space? The Riddler glanced up at the heavens. <sighs> a bit extreme, don't you think? <laughs> Was it? The question gave her pause. To be honest, she had hurled Clayface into orbit without even thinking about it. She felt a twinge of guilt. Despite his monstrous appearance, Matt Hagen wasn't actually a soulless demon like Pharyngula, just a bizarrely mutated human being. Then again, the thought popped into her mind. It wasn't like he didn't have it coming. No biggie. He's just dirt, and uh, dirt will fall back to Earth sooner or later. Maybe. The Riddler's once dapper outfit was now liberally coated with damp clay, he wiped his filthy hands on his trousers and straightened his tie. Certainly, Hagen has proved ridiculously durable over the years. And yet, I've spent enough time around Arkham to recognize when someone is out of control. And I'm not talking about Clayface. Mary recalled her conversation with Billy. She shrugged, trying to pretend that the Riddler's snide remark hadn't hit a nerve. Hmm... I admit I don't really know my own strength anymore. <clears throat> if I may be so bold as to make a suggestion, perhaps you should consider seeking a mentor. Maybe someone who specializes in magic. Or perhaps anger management. Twenty-nine and counting. The Nanoverse. molecules loomed like small moons as Donna Troy and her new companions began their search for Ray Palmer. Encased in a transparent sphere of shimmering energy, courtesy of the Monitor's virtually unlimited technology, they shrank in size much as the Atom himself once did, discovering a whole new realm of existence at the subatomic level. Outside the sphere, electrons whizzed about spinning nuclei, looking like sparking comets. Atoms of various shapes and sizes collided with each other, sometimes linking to form larger molecules that resembled elaborate glowing constellations. Everything was in constant motion. Quantum particles blinked in and out of existence according to the capricious laws of probability. Was this what atoms and molecules really looked like at this scale? Or was her brain just processing all this bizarre sensory input into images she could sort of comprehend? Anna suspected the latter. Human eyes weren't built to see the world this way. They'd probably already shrunk beyond the wavelengths of visible light. So where exactly are we supposed to be going again? And how are we supposed to find the atom in all this sci-fi craziness? A crimson mask once more concealed Jason's features. Donna guessed that he was feeling out of his element here. He was more used to beating up crooks in Gotham than embarking on microscopic odysseys. She, on the other hand, had already been from one end of the universe to another, and then some. Before he disappeared, 
Ray Palmer often explored this so-called Maniverse. According to my research, he spent some time in one particular subatomic realm to which we now travel. There's no guarantee we'll actually find the app there. The Nanoverse is a big place, relatively speaking. But it's as good a place as any to start looking for it. If you say so. Anyway, don't look now, but it seems like we're getting somewhere. Outside the sphere, molecules broke apart into atoms, which dissolved into swirls of pulsating quarks, gluons, bosons, and neutrinos. A single particle soon filled the horizon, growing larger and larger as the sphere and its passengers shrank to meet it. Oceans and continents covered the surface of what now appeared to be a full-sized planet. As the sphere came in for a landing amidst a vast, verdant jungle, Anna found it hard to grasp that this entire world was actually infinitesimal in size. Indeed, we have reached our destination. Let us pray that it shall be the first and final stop on our journey. Yeah, right. We should be so lucky. The golden sphere dissolved into the ether, leaving the trio standing in a sunny meadow, surrounded by dense undergrowth. The torrid temperature came as a jolt after the autumnal chill of the cemetery back in San Francisco. Donna didn't envy Jason, his heavy black leather gear. Glancing up, she saw that the light and heat came from a glowing yellow orb high in the sky. A solitary photon? Or some sort of radioactive particle? It took Donna a moment to realize how small they were compared to the scenery around them. Leafy ferns the size of pine trees towered over them. Grass blades as white as broadswords stretched above their heads, hemming them in. Was there a reason that the Monitor had chosen to bring them into this world in such diminutive proportions? Frankly, Donna didn't like the idea of being Lilliputian-sized in an alien jungle. Who knew what kind of predators were lurking in this lush, primeval wilderness? She turned to the Monitor, but a sudden rustling in the greenery put them all on guard. Looks like we've got company. Jason drew a 12-inch Bowie knife from his belt. Wanna bet they're not friendly? We don't know that. Remember, no unnecessary violence. Don't tell me that. Tell them. A party of armed warriors burst through the high grass walls, surrounding them on all sides. Donna blinked in surprise. She wasn't quite sure what sort of being she'd expected to find on a subatomic particle, but it wasn't ape men riding giant frogs. But that was the best description of what confronted them now. Shaggy primates, who vaguely resembled Earth's ancient Neanderthals, sat astride massive amphibians the size of hippopotami. Crudely sewn animal skins were reinforced by breastplates and armbands carved from polished bone. The warriors brandished primitive spears, clubs, and shields. Deep-set eyes regarded the strangers with undisguised suspicion. The beings were roughly the same size as the newcomers, Donna realized, that had to be why the Monitor shrank them down so far, so that they could more easily communicate with the natives. How dare you invade our kingdom? Name yourself, Outlanders! An intricate carved ivory helmet and voluminous fur cloak suggested that this ape-man was in command of the warriors. Please, we come in peace. We are seeking a friend of ours. You may know him as Ray Palmer, or perhaps the Atom. You will find no friends here. And we will not betray Ray Palmer to the likes of you. I know a demon when I see one. I am a monitor, not a shadow demon. If you know where the Adam may be found, you must tell us immediately. The monitor strode aggressively toward the mounted ruler. Hold your tongue, abomination! The chieftain goaded his frog forward to meet the monitor. I am Windar, ruler of this domain. And I do not answer to the commands of outsiders. Poison sprayed from swollen glands above the huge amphibian's bulging eyes. The toxic discharge splattered harmlessly against the monitor's personal force field. But he frowned in annoyance. His right hand glowed ominously as he pointed at the frog. No! Donna stepped between the monitor and the indignant chieftain. Hear us out! Give words a chance before bloodshed! Nice try, Donna. But there's only one language these missing links will understand. Jason's carbon steel knife gleamed in the light of the microsun. Windar spied the blade at once. Attack! His warriors lunged at the intruders from all sides. Donna reluctantly went on the defensive. A monstrous frog leapt toward her, seemingly intent on crushing her beneath its webbed feet, but she blocked its descent with one hand. Ah! 
Grabbing hold of the creature's clammy belly, she hurled it over her head into a throng of warriors behind her. The frog's rider crashed headfirst into his own kinsmen, scattering them across the meadow. Another frog rider bounded at her from the left. Die, she devil! He swung the jawbone of an unknown beast at Donna's head. She easily parried the blow with her bracelet, shattering the crude weapon. Sorry. The warrior was out like a light before he hit the ground. Riderless, the panicked frog jumped over Donna into the safety of the beckoning jungle. A few yards away, another warrior raised his club and charged at the monitor from behind. But the monitor casually teleported out of the way so that the warrior's club swung through empty air, leaving the baffled ape man gaping in confusion. Can you conclude this bestial melee soon? The monitor casually reappeared, a few feet away from where he had been standing before. The longer we must search for Ray Palmer, the less likely we shall find him in time. Do not speak his name, foul creature. Windar shook his spear in the monitor's direction. If it was from you he fled, then let your hunt end here! Intent upon the monitor, the chieftain was caught off guard when Jason sprang at him from the side. <laughs> knocking him off his steed, they tumbled together onto the floor of the meadow, Windar's body cushioning Jason's fall. <laughs> the ivory helmet tumbled from the warrior's thick skull as Jason softened him up with a vicious punch to the jaw. <laughs> Listen, jackass! His knee pressing down onto Windar's chest, Jason waved his knife in his opponent's face. It's obvious Ray Palmer is a friend of yours. Great. So are we. Jason, wait! Wait. You claim to be friends of Palmer? That would be easier to believe without your blade in my face. You asked for it with the lousy welcome you gave us. Now listen, my friends here are reasonable people, but I'm not. And I'm tired of being jerked around. So tell me where to find the atom, or your nose will bleed out the back of your skull. Donna hoped he was bluffing. Windar stared cross-eyed at the knife. A trickle of blood ran from his nostril. The entire meadow seemed to hold its breath waiting to see what happened next. <laughs> Gods below! You really mean it! I did not think the world of humans produced such warriors. Jason backed off and helped the chieftain to his feet. <laughs> it produced Ray Palmer, didn't it? That it did. Although I fear your world has also done its best to crush his spirit. Windar gestured to his troops who obediently lowered their weapons. This is true. He has seen much sorrow in our realm. He did not speak of it, but his woe was plain to see when he passed through here some time ago. In past years, he was a merry hero who once did my people a great service. But now he seems to have lost his way. We told him that only powerful magics could undo the doom that had befallen them. And where would one seek such magics? For that, you must consult the shaman. Bring forth the wise one! Waving blades of grass parted behind the warriors, and a newcomer entered the meadow. A hooded cloak, dyed a brilliant shade of red, hid the shaman's features. Small and slight of build, the nameless mystic walked softly through the grass. Charms and amulets adorned her slender arms and neck. Windar and his warriors bowed their heads in respect. You gotta be joking. We're not seriously planning to take our marching orders from some pint-sized witch doctor. Quiet. On Paradise Island, one learns to heed the counsel of the oracles. Donna bowed her own head to the hooded figure and pressed her palms together, forming a steeple beneath her chin. We are honored by your presence. Hail, travelers. The shaman drew back her hood, revealing the elven features of a young girl who appeared no more than six years old. More evolved than her Neanderthal cohorts, her waifish face was fine-boned and delicate. Large golden eyes hinted at wisdom far beyond her apparent years. I am Kodessa, High Priestess of this realm. You? <laughs> You're barely old enough to- I was igniting suns when your people had fins, Jason Todd. Yes, I know who you are. I also know from whence you and your companions have come and what you desire. Ancient prophecies foretold of three travelers who would become the challengers of the unknown. The Ray Palmer passed this way on his journey, but he has left the inner worlds behind. You must seek him amidst the myriad earths of your own plane of existence. 
It took Donna a moment to realize what Cadessa meant. The multiverse? Unlike most mortals, Donna was well aware that there were at least 52 alternate versions of Earth, located in parallel universes separated by sturdy dimensional barriers. Had the Atom somehow learned how to slip past those barriers? Yes. Unable to find peace here, he left to find a new life on another Earth. Which Earth? Which universe? <sighs> that I cannot say. I know only that the spirits have spoken to me of a great disaster that only the Ray Palmer can avert. Find him you must, so allow me to send you on your way. She raised her hands above her head. An unearthly green glow radiated from her childish form, and the world of Cadessa and her people began to shrink away. Farewell, challengers. And should you encounter the Ray Palmer in time, tell him that we are praying for him and for all the worlds that be. Donna grabbed onto Jason's hand as the shaman's spell whisked them away. Twenty-eight, and counting. Metropolis. Located 500 feet below the city, Project Cadmus was the world's foremost genetics facility. The top-secret think tank, whose existence Jimmy had stumbled onto a few years back, struck him as his best shot at getting to the bottom of his mysterious new powers. Fortunately, the scientists of the project seemed eager to oblige. We've been tracking your exploits as Mr. Action. Dr. Serling Roquette escorted Jimmy through one of Cadmus's many underground corridors. The 16-year-old prodigy looked and dressed like any ordinary teenage mall rat, complete with denim shorts and a faded black t-shirt advertising a punk rock band that Jimmy had never heard of. Few people would ever guess that the slim young blonde was actually the project's head of genetics. You come up with that costume yourself? That bad, huh? I'm more curious as to why you took up crime fighting. What exactly makes that a natural response to incipient meta-human capability? Maybe it's not for other people, but I've been on the sidelines of the hero scene for years. Superman's pal, you know? And it's been an honor, but still, a part of me feels left out, and less than. Like I'm starving to death with my nose pressed up to the bakery window. Really? Because most costume vigilantes have complicated, stressful lives. They also have a purpose, and... A destiny, I guess. Things I always hoped would materialize for me someday. They walked past a series of experimental labs and menageries. Windows offered glimpses of various genetically engineered oddities, like a glow-in-the-dark chimpanzee and water-breathing rabbits. I suppose I hoped that my new powers meant that I'd finally earn a place at the table with the people I admire most. Stainless steel doors parted, and they entered a high-tech laboratory packed with futuristic hardware so advanced that Jimmy couldn't begin to guess its functions. Computers lined the walls. A flat steel bed was in a chamber, surrounded by robotic arms, also known as Waldos. Impressive-looking scanners and lenses were affixed to the ends of the arms. Dials and gauges were installed in the sides of the examination table. A posted notice read, Warning, mutagenic materials, handle with care. A glowing green crystal, embedded in some sort of X-ray projector, looked suspiciously like kryptonite. Jimmy hoped to get Hauser here, knew what she was doing. I'm afraid we need you down to your undies for this, and I'll need your signal watch. Uh, right. Unpleasant memories of Arkham surfaced as he stripped down to his boxer shorts, blushing in embarrassment. This is cold. He lay down atop the metallic table while she attached electrodes to his chest and temples. She strapped his limbs to the table. This is just to keep you from squirming. What does this thing do again? You won't feel a thing. It's like a CAT scan, only more metaphysical. Excuse me. She retreated to the safety of an enclosed control room at the south end of the laboratory. A thick sheet of transparent plexiglass cut her off from Jimmy, leaving him alone in the sterile chamber. He tugged experimentally on his restraints. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, how do you mean metaphysical? You ever hear of biofeedback? This device measures your brain waves and cerebral activity. It then manufactures a three-dimensional holographic composite of your subconscious mind for analysis. Past studies you see suggest the brain waves of metahumans are significantly different from those of normal humans. I'll take your word for it. 
Suddenly, being an everyday mortal didn't sound so bad. He didn't care for the idea that there was something weird going on in his brain. Just relax. Let the ambient neural ultraspectrometer do its thing. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Why don't you just use an acronym? <laughs> Think about it. Oh. Just relax. She flicked a switch, and automated sensors whirred around Jimmy's supine form, scanning him from a variety of directions. His whole brain felt like it was full of static. His forehead started throbbing painfully. Brightly colored energies arced between the elevated scanners. The flashing lights hurt Jimmy's eyes, forcing him to squeeze them shut. He thought she said this wasn't supposed to hurt. Okay, we're up and... What? Jimmy's eyes snapped open. A shimmering holographic wall had materialized above him, winding like a serpent just below the ceiling. An ineffable golden light radiated from the immense wall, while the armored figures of bizarre alien beings appeared to be melded to the dense stone or marble of the wall. The beams' empty eye sockets glowed with preternatural energy. Their immobile faces and bodies blended with the hard, unyielding substance of the barrier. Planetary spheres floated above and below the coils of the wall, which dwarfed the surrounding holographic worlds. An incredibly complex equation, couched in exotic, indecipherable symbols, snaked its way along the length of the wall. What is this? Who Spielberg your synapses? The source. Jimmy somehow knew instinctively that the awe-inspiring panoply represented something called the source wall, which divided the physical universe from a higher realm beyond. The source was the ultimate mystery behind all of creation, at least according to the new gods. And the figures adorning the wall were no mere sculptures. They were the Promethean giants, a race of ancient immortals who had sought to breach the barrier, only to become part of it for all eternity. It was said, although by whom Jimmy could not recall, that the soul of a new god returned to the source upon the death of its corporeal shell. Electricity crackled around his aching skull. An excruciating sound filled his ears. His mouth tasted like ash. His brain felt like it was going to explode. Oh, I don't feel so good. Jimmy, your head, it's growing. Jimmy spotted his reflection in the polished steel ceiling. The teenage genius wasn't joking. His brain was literally expanding beneath his scalp, blowing up like a balloon. Throbbing veins stood out upon his inflated cranium. Oh, God! Something's wrong! Stop this! I'm trying! Lifting his oversized head from the table, Jimmy glimpsed her through the protective plexiglass screen. Dr. Roquette was frantically working the controls. I can't shut it down! Your brain is telepathically attacking the spectrometer! The holographic source wall blinked out of existence. The static in Jimmy's brain diminished in volume, and for a moment, he thought the worst was over. You're doing something! I feel different! Oh. Different, but not necessarily better. The pressure inside his skull gave way to a soggy feeling all over his body. Oh. Spikes protruded from his skin, even as his body softened into a flabby, gelatinous mass. Ringed suckers opened up along his arms and fingers, so that he looked like some bizarre genetic hybrid of an octopus, a porcupine, and a jellyfish. Only his red hair, blue eyes, and freckles kept him slightly recognizable as James Bartholomew Olson. Help! What's happening to me? I don't know! You're overloading the sensors! An overhead monitor erupted emitting a shower of white-hot sparks onto Jimmy. Oozing free of their bonds, his elastic limbs flailed about wildly. Automated sensor on crashed to the floor. A salvo of razor-sharp quills speared expensive electronic equipment. Crimson heat rays shot from his eyes, leaving scorch marks on the walls and ceiling. Uh, uh, I'm sorry! I, I can't... Control it! Jimmy yanked the electrodes off his skin and rolled clumsily off the table onto the floor. His arms and legs were stretched all out of proportion, but somehow he managed to stand upright. Concentrating with all his might, 
He fought to keep his rubbery bones at least partially solid. I... I can pay for all this. Those sensors are three million apiece. Okay, I can't pay for it. Jimmy looked around desperately for some place where he couldn't cause any more damage. And not just because of the money. With his powers out of control like this, it was only a matter of time before he accidentally hurt or killed Dr. Serling. The plexiglass screen between them looked like it was ready to shatter at any minute. They gotta get out of here! Pronto! Wait! His frantic gaze fastened on a circular drain built into the floor. Uh, this is gonna be gross. I just know it. He flung himself onto the drain and let his flesh and bones melt into a syrupy mess. The sickening smell of our sewage wafted up from the pipes below. Leaving Project Cadmus behind, he slid down the drain. Yeah. <laughs>